Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. I hope you're doing great. Before we jump into it, I'd like to remind you to like and subscribe and comment and share this video. It really does help. Now I'm going to be remaking an old video that I've already made. A, a tour of my antique jewelry and some jewelry that's not antique but looks the part. I already made this video, but what happens when I'm stressed is I kind of turn into a little bit of a shopaholic for little inexpensive doodads. And uh, I've been in law school for the last three years and that's one of the most stressful things that you can do to yourself if you're living in a first world country which i am and that means that i've bought a lot more jewelry so i'm remaking that video also under that video i had a couple of people saying that they wanted me to put in more close-up shots which i didn't do so some of the same stuff is going to be appearing in this video that was in that video and then there's going to be some new stuff as well none of what i'm going to be showing is very expensive i i, I don't want this to come off as as a, a flexing video i think that flexing is uh, absolutely horrendous i can't abide it so i really am am not trying to flex in this video i'm trying to show pretty things and talk about how you can tell when they were made most of the things in this video cost under 30 dollars there are a couple of things that were more expensive. I think the m most expensive thing I'm going to show in this video that I bought was maybe $130. So I'm, I'll tell you when I'm showing something that was more expensive. And then there are a couple of things that could be more expensive or could be worth more that were either gifts or were inherited. So yes, I'm not, I'm not trying to flex and I'm not also not trying to you know, say, look at this pretty thing that I have and you don't have. So I just want to be very aware of that and, and not come across as being braggadocious or anything like that. So I hope that it does not come across that way. And I hope that you enjoy this video. So here we go. Now I was going to say how to collect antique jewelry on a budget. My, really my tips are scour antique stores, thrift stores, and eBay. And you're going to come across deals every once in a while. So just be vigilant. This is a collection that I've been working on for a long time. The other part of the equation is uh, uh, get, a, get a boyfriend who buys you pretty presents because some of the nicest things in this video were gifts from my boyfriend. So that's also a great way of collecting antique jewelry on a budget is getting somebody to buy it for you. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy. A huge, huge thank you to the people who support this channel on Patreon. Their names are going to be listed at the end of the video. If you'd also like to support me on Patreon, there'll be a link below. No hard feelings if you can't. I certainly understand money being tight. Although there will be hard feelings if you don't follow me on Instagram because it is free. There will also be a link below and my email will also be linked below in case you need to get in touch with me for any reason. This is the first one up. This is a, a taxidermied grouse foot. This is Scottish. It was not actually designed to be worn by a woman at the neck of her bodice or what have you. It's a kilt pin. So men would wear these at the bottom of the kilt where the kilt crosses over just to weigh it down a little bit so it won't blow up, not explode, but like billow up and reveal a bit more than is supposed to be revealed. These were actually kind of controversial because it was feared that the claws could catch on ladies' dresses while a man and a woman were dancing together. But they still make them today. This one is antique. It dates from, I believe, the 1880s, somewhere between the 1880s and 1910. It's a little bit ghoulish. I don't have a problem with that in principle, but I have not found a chance to wear it yet, although I'm not opposed to wearing it when I do find a way to wear it. I would wear it just as a brooch, not as a, not as a kilt pin, because I don't have a kilt. I got this on eBay. I bought it with a gift card, so I'm guessing it was somewhere between $25 and $50. Little micro mosaic brooch. This is Italian. It likely dates from the... Hmm, somewhere between 1910 and 1930. And it's just a very simple little thing. So what this is, is uh, little pieces of uh, glass that have been put in here to make this design. And this was a very popular Italian kind of brooch, and you would oftentimes get these as souvenirs when you went to Italy. Some of them will actually say Italy or Rome on them, like on the front. I think that looks a little tacky, honestly. And these could get incredibly elaborate. This one is definitely less elaborate but I really love its sort of rustic, very artistic style. And although this one isn't, is most likely not Victorian, judging by the clasp, 
This is not really a Victorian style of clasp. I will show you Victorian clasps later on in this video. Uh, it's definitely a style that was around in the Victorian era. And this was a uh, present from my boyfriend. He gave it to me for Christmas. To carry on with the bar pins, these are three other bar pins that I have. This one was the first one I bought. I bought this back in high school and the clasp broke at one point and then I couldn't wear it for ages but I fixed it when I bought a soldering iron. It's gold rolled, not very expensive but very pretty. This one also gold rolled. I bought it also in high school also not very expensive, and it was enameled with black. You can still see some of the traces of enamel. In fact, the last time I filmed this video, I said that I was gonna go in there with a paintbrush and fix it, and I still have not done so. So maybe I'll do that eventually. This also dates from the late 19th century. You can see the T-bar clasp there. And this is a, another, this is a variation on that C clasp. And then this one is post 19th century. This actually looks quite 20s or 30s to me. This belongs to my great grandmother. And I don't wear it very often. It's a bit modern style for me, but it is still quite pretty. I think we're going to get into the coral next. So this is Victorian or early Edwardian, and they had a lot of different methods of using coral. Some, they could make it into beads. They could set it in these very artistic gold kind of lover's knots, they're called. I have a couple more coral stuff that are more elaborate, but this is just very simple. They've just taken a piece of coral and put it on a brooch. So it just looks like you've got a piece of coral floating at your neck. And I just think this is absolutely gorgeous. I also got this one on eBay with another gift card. This is a very Victorian style of clasp. So you see this hinge? This is called a T-bar hinge because it looks like a T. And it's got a little, uh, it's, it's a hinge look very much like a door hinge. So I'm going to come up close to the camera. And so you can see this hinges like that. So the middle part hinges and then these two end parts don't. And then there's a pin in there. So this is hollow and it hinges like that. And then this kind of hook clasp is also very Victorian. And you'll also, a very, a telltale sign that something is Victorian is if the pin sticks out far beyond the clasp. So I think this is just very, very, very pretty. And it really plays into the sort of love that the Victorians had of nature and naturalistic things. So oftentimes they would find ways of wearing just pieces of nature on them that were very unadorned. The, the, the piece of nature is in and of itself the adornment. This is another style of coral brooch. This one is, I think, 19th century. It's got, it's got Victorian written all over it. It just looks very, very Victorian. However, I believe the clasp has been replaced at some point. This is a modern hinge and this safety catch is also modern. So I believe that the hinge or that the clasp has been replaced at some point. But this is the lover's knot style I was I mentioned earlier. It's pieces of coral that are held into these circle circles of I believe this is gold filled or rolled gold. It's certainly not uh, solid gold, but it's held into these little circles with these bits of gold wire. This was a birthday present from my boyfriend. So I did not buy this one either. Although I had been coveting it and I told him that I wanted it. Next up are these two earrings. These are other lovers not coral designs. And they are, I bought them to go along with the, the brooch that I just showed you. And they do match it remarkably well. Uh, they are about 50% larger than I thought they were gonna be. So they're, they're kind of big and heavy, but they go so well with the brooch that I still can't help but to wear them. And actually these are also brooches. And like the other brooch, I think these clasps have been replaced at some point in time because once again these just have Victorian written all over them but the clasps are and the pins are not of a Victorian style so I think they were replaced at some time but I uh, bought them and then I just put these hooks on there this little loop was already there so I think actually what they might have originally been is that you would pin them 
to your collar like that and then there were chains coming from here and then there's something else hanging in the middle in between them but I just got them as these two things so I just put hooks on there and I use them as earrings. This is a brooch made out of Scottish agate. This was another very popular style in the 19th century, this, this Scottish agate brooch. And this is another one of those very naturalistic styles. It's, you, it's not very adorned. There's just this very simple setting, but really the agate it, is, left, is left to speak for itself. This is the original pin. You can see it's got the T-bar. And at some point when I was wearing it, the little C clasp came off. So I had to solder it back on. And you can see I did not do the best job. The solder kind of melted and dripped down the side. And I there's really not a way of getting that off. So that's sort of sad. But you can't really see it from the front. To go along with that brooch, I have these two earrings. These are carnelian. And these belonged to my mother, and I coveted them for ages, and she gave them to me when I turned 21. They are set in silver. I don't believe that they're actually Victorian, but they have a very Victorian look. It's certainly not something that would have looked out of place in the Victorian era. So I, and I wear them with that brooch because they match well enough. They're not an exact match, but as long as you're not looking very, very closely, they look well enough together. This brooch I bought in college for $15. It's, it's the complete antithesis of the other very naturalistic styles that I've shown you. This is very much ornate and heavily wrought and kind of overdone. It looks very 1870s to me. I have no way of confirming that. It's got the original T-bar clasp, and you can see back here how this is all connected. It originally had another one of these bands going across here, but it was missing when I bought the brooch, so I just glued this pearl on there. And these little tassel things are were very popular in the 19th century. This is a, a sort of two-in-one. This is an antique watch, and I bought this in the summer of 2019, and it did work when I bought it. I went to the antique store, I wound it up, and then I left for two days and came back to see if it was still keeping time. And it was. So I thought, well, hooray, it works. So I bought it and then a couple months later it stopped working. So eventually I'll have it repaired. That is quite expensive to do. So I'm not going to do it right now, but eventually I will save up the money to have it repaired. And then this little brooch I bought last summer at an antique store. It's the little jade leaf. It was like maybe five dollars and I thought it would look really great as a watch brooch so what I did was I took a nail and I just soldered it on here now this is completely reversible I can take the nail off and it will be just exactly how it was just a little jade leaf with no nail for hanging a watch but I just thought that it would look so cute holding a watch so I put that on I don't have any issue with reworking old jewelry as long as you're doing it in a way that is not going to permanently damage it. Like these earrings, they're not permanently damaged. I just put a little hook on this loop that was already there. With these, I just soldered something on that I can very easily take off. But I just think this little jade ivy leaf is so cute. And I think it goes very nicely with that watch. This little ball, this is a little watch fob, I believe. I bought this because I thought it was cute. I have never worn it. And then this is an, a watch pin. This is, this is designed to have a watch hanging from it. So that's what it's, that's what a watch pin is supposed to look like. I put it on, I, it did not come on this, I put it onto here. I bought this as a gift for somebody, but then I found something that would work better, so I didn't end up giving it to her. And now it's just in my jewelry box. This is lapis lazuli, or lapis lazuli. I'm never sure how to pronounce it and it's surrounded by seed pearls. And this is another original clasp. You can see the T-bar, and this is called a trumpet fastening. This was invented in the 1850s, and you see it, it's, it was never incredibly common, but it appeared kind of periodically from the 1850s to the 1930s. Now, this brooch, it's a brooch and a pendant. The chain is not original to it, the chain belonged to my grandmother. This dates from the late 19th century. Even though this fastening could potentially 
place it later, it doesn't necessarily do so. And I mean, just look at it. I mean, that has Victorian written all over it. So this definitely dates from the late 19th century. Oh, also you see the, the T-bar class, but that's another dead giveaway for the 19th century. And this was another gift fra from my boyfriend. He gave it to me for Valentine's Day. We saw this when we went to the antique shops right before Christmas on the trip where he bought me this. And this caught both of our eyes and he said that he really wanted to buy it for me, but I wouldn't let him because it was, it was too expensive and he'd already bought me a Christmas present. And then he went back and bought it for me for Valentine's Day. I just think that it is so incredibly beautiful and it is definitely one of my favorite pieces of jewelry, if not my absolute favorite. This is a silver and moonstone necklace. Moonstones are my, my favorite gemstone. I also do not know how old this is. This looks, this has an older look to it. I would not be surprised if this came from the 1910s because this was a kind of style, these, these moonstone drops on silver in the 1910s. And this was given to me as a birthday present by a friend in high school. In keeping with the Moonstone theme, this is a brooch that I stole from my mother. It's also not Victorian. This is the, again, the original clasp. But it, it's Victorian in style. This sort of half moon, crescent moon motif was very, very, very popular in the 19th century. And you can see it's got a Moonstone, a, an amethyst, and opal there. And I wear this on my ball gown at, my, at the neckline. This is a utilitarian thing. It is called a lorgnette. What you do is you pull down this little button here, it goes downwards, and it pops open. And it's a little pair of glasses. They're not prescription. They are just little magnifying glasses, but they're very helpful if you're reading something with fine print. These are also rolled gold. I was examining them after I filmed, and they're actually marked 14 karat gold. So I guess I got a good deal on them. I bought them from an antique shop, and they're on their original ribbon still. This is another very naturalistic brooch. This is abalone. This was a very popular stone shell, I guess, a very popular shell in the 19th century. And it's really just allowed to speak for itself. This is not a very popular Victorian hinge, but this clasp is very popular. So I'm not sure if perhaps the hinge has been replaced at some point or what, but this dates from somewhere around the turn of the century. There's no man-made ornamentation on this at all. It's just a piece of abalone set in silver. So it's very similar, I think, to this, where it's just letting the natural material speak for itself. And I think it's so lovely. Now, this brooch is quite rare, and I probably should have paid a lot more for it than I did. This is made out of scarab beetles, and this was I'm not gonna say it was very popular because they're kind of rare. This was popular with a, a subset of people. It was not, certainly not for everybody. It is a little ghoulish wearing dead insects at your neck. This is also Victorian. It's not got the T-bar hinge, but it has this very Victorian clasp. So I believe this has been replaced at some point. This was part of the Egyptian revival. And this is, again, I think very similar to these brooches where it's just a natural material that's really allowed to just speak for itself. These iridescent green shells are so bright and gorgeous. They're really as good as any gemstone and they really, they don't need anything else. They can speak for themselves very well. There's a kind of a ghoulish surprise underneath because oftentimes these are closed off at the back, but they're not here. You can see their little beetly legs under there. This is another rare little thing. This is a handkerchief holder. So you put your handkerchief in there, then you slide this down, thereby locking the handkerchief in, and then when you're at a ball and you don't, you aren't carrying a handbag, you wear it like that, so you have your handkerchief with you. This is not the kind of thing that you would wear every day because it's kind of inconvenient to have a handkerchief handing, hanging from your hand at all times, but it is, it's, so it's a, a thing for a party when you're not carrying a handbag. It is probably rolled gold or gold filled. I, I don't think that it's solid gold. And it's done in the shape of an oak leaf. I bought this when I was a senior in high school for probably 20 or 30 or 40 dollars, somewhere around there. I was a senior in high school, so I could not have spent much more than that on it. This is a ring. I bought it for myself when I graduated high school. It was a 
self-indulgent purchase. It's not the greatest quality. It's, it is gold, but it's a very low carat. I brought it to a jeweler who was very, very snotty. She said, oh yes, they're very low quality rubies and diamond chips. So it's not the most expensive ring. It's also not Victorian. It was it was very expensive for just having graduated high school me, but it wasn't. It's not expensive for actual adults. But I was still pleased with it, and I still think it's pretty, although I don't wear it very often because it's quite big and it, it's hard to wear gloves with it and it kind of catches on things. And I don't know exactly when it's from. I would guess maybe 20s or 30s, 1910s, somewhere, somewhere post-1910, pre-1950, I think. This watch was given to me. I was at a a protest rally for climate change in college and a woman came up and to me and said hey my great-grandmother was a suffragette in the early 19th century or in the early 20th century I'm gonna send you her watch so she did it doesn't work but it is still incredibly beautiful and I think it's so sweet that she gave it to me so I put it on this watch fob made from the hair of a dead woman now I know it was a woman's hair because the hair is quite long. I bought this at an antique shop as a, a gift to myself when I finished my first year of law school. It's set in gold rolled fittings. Now this is made of human hair and oftentimes you'll see something, anything that's made out of human hair will be labeled as mourning. And it's true that hair work was often done for mourning, but just because something is made of hair does not mean that it was necessarily for mourning. You could have something made from the hair of a loved one if they were going away for a while as a token of remembrance, or if it was just somebody you loved and they weren't going away and you weren't gonna be parted from them, but you just wanted to have a little memento of them around. I have saved a lock of my boyfriend's hair that I plan to have put into a brooch, even though he is not dead and God willing will not be for a long time, it'd still be nice to just have that little memento of him around. So uh, I say it's made from the hair of a dead woman because she's definitely dead now because this dates from the late 19th century, but she was not necessarily dead when this was made. Uh, another another piece of evidence for, for not all hair jewelry being mourning is that it's actually quite rare to find hair jewelry or hair work done with gray hair. It's oftentimes with hair that has not yet gone gray or white. The exception to this is with hair wreaths. Hair wreaths, which are put in shadow boxes and hung on the wall, are more likely to contain gray hair. So it seems to me that hair jewelry, while it could be used for mourning, would oftentimes be made before the person died, and then it could be put into a mourning thing, or at least the hair would be taken long before the person died, and then kept around for years, and then made into jewelry after the person died, because it's not gray hair. And then hair wreaths would be woven from hair taken after the person died or when the person was old. This was one of the few things in my collection that I spent money on. I spent a lot of money on this was I think $130. So it was a, a rare splurge for me. These next two I'm gonna do kind of in one. These, because they're both the same thing. These are both pencils that you hang on a chain around your neck. So this one has a little fob with some seed pearls in it. And this is a pencil, it's faux tortoise shell set in gold, and you twist it and the lead comes out and it's engraved with the name of the original owner. Leonore Woodward and the kind of the reason I bought it is because of this interesting little catcher So this hook goes either over your waistband or into a buttonhole and then the pencil hangs at a convenient Spot and then the chain is around your neck for safety. So that's kind of rare. I've never seen a, a Fob with a hook like that and then this is another fob. This one is a little chaste design a little chain and this is just a pencil. It doesn't have the hook, so I just kind of tuck this into a buttonhole or into my waistband. And it's a little pencil, and you twist it, and the lead comes out. And the pencil, I think, is probably a bit post-Victorian. I think that's probably 1910s or 20s, but the chain is definitely Victorian. And then this is yet another chain. You kind of end up collecting these kinds of watch or pencil chains. <laughs> they kind of just accumulate. This one's got a little pearl and star design. This kind of star pattern was very popular in the 19th century. This one I also showed the last time I made this video. This is uh, one of the most spectacular cameos I have ever seen. So it belonged to my grandmother's great aunt. So that means my grandmother was born in 1935. So depending on when her great aunt was born and when her great aunt got it, this dates from somewhere between 1850 and 1900. This is a depiction of Aphrodite on her seashell 
pulled by swans. It's set in probably rolled gold. It's kind of interesting that it's not set in real gold because this would have been quite pricey and I don't know how anybody in my family afforded to buy this uh, <laughs> because we were never quite rich but this this would have been a pricey item. You can see how detailed the carving is and a cameo at the neck would have been very very popular in the 19th century. It's got its original clasp. You can see here this bit of gold is, is brighter than the rest because one time when I was wearing it, this broke. And luckily I caught it before it smashed to a million pieces on the ground, but I had to have it repaired. And it's got the original C thing, but now I've strung this little gold chain onto the bottom and I fastened, I always clip this onto a loop on my bodice, just in case the clasp goes again, it'll be caught by the chain when it falls. I don't wear it incredibly frequently because it is nice and probably worth something. I've never had it appraised or anything, just based on what I've seen of other cameos, so I'm kind of afraid to wear it all <laughs> that frequently, but it is absolutely gorgeous. I have no idea how I got so lucky as to have it, but there you have it. My, my grandmother didn't tell me she was giving it to me either. She just kind of sent, I just got a package from her in the mail one day and it was a stationary box. So I thought that she was giving me a hint that she wanted me to write more often. And then I opened it and it was this and my jaw just hit the floor and I was unable to pick it up for the next several minutes. This is an interesting little ring. It's set in 10 karat gold. And this I believe is a tooth. I can't really think of anything else that it could be. Just that color and it's sort of weird translucent appearance, I believe that that is a tooth. And 19th century mothers would sometimes save their children's milk teeth and have them set into jewelry. It's similar to hair jewelry, it's just a sentimental thing. My one piece of pause comes from the fact that it is not really shaped like a tooth. It's very long and pointy and teeth are generally not that long and pointy. So maybe it has been filed down or sanded down to a more a shape that's more conducive to a ring, which actually kind of looks like it could have happened. Cause if you see the way it's curved, it looks like it could have been maybe repeated over here like that. So maybe that's the case, or maybe it was the tooth of a pet. If you, if you can think of anything else that that could be other than a tooth, please let me know. But I just think this is such a fascinating ring. I bought this on eBay, also probably around 50 bucks. This is a sort of uncommon piece of jewelry. This is a belt made out of, it's silver plate, I believe it's brass, silver plated. Rich people could have them made out of solid silver. I am not rich people. And it, it dates from late 19th, early 20th century, and it fastens very simply like that. And sometimes you'll see these referred to as nurse belts, but there's, there are plenty of pictures of non-nurses wearing them. It was a, it was a, just a fashionable thing. It feels quite summery to me, so I really only wear it in the summer. This I hardly ever wear. It's a belt buckle. I like this little ivy leaf there, but I hardly ever wear it because it's kind of sh sharp at the top and bottom. So it always ends up wearing out a hole in your shirt waist up here and in your skirt down there. So I seldom wear it, but it's still pretty. It's made out of pewter, I think, early 19th or early 20th century. This box contains a watch. Now this watch dates from the 1850s or 60s. I got this at a flea market. Uh, this is another one I, I paid quite a bit. I think I paid like 120 bucks for this, even though it doesn't work. It's made of, this is either jet or French jet, which is a fancy word for glass. It's probably French jet. And it's set in either pewter or, I, I doubt it's silver, but I guess it could be. And then the watch itself is made out of vulcanized rubber, which is it's a type of, it's hardened rubber basically. And then it opens in the back and you see here, this is where you'd go. You bring this little thing around and that's how you change the time. And then down here is how you wind it. I can't wind it because it's all wound up and it doesn't run. And then it's protected by this piece of rock crystal and it's in its original box. And someday I would love to have this repaired so it works. All right. Thank you so much for watching. Again, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope to see you here next time. Bye-bye.